where I live, which are full of fungi right now, uh, full of mushrooms. There's a lot of foraging going on. And if this is something you're interested in, I encourage you to get a skillful guide. Uh, there are people leading weekend trips into the forests of Sonoma and Marin and Mendocino counties, probably even to, into the hills of Berkeley as well. But um, it's something that is a lot of fun, full of discovery um, and, and potentially uh, dangerous. So you have to be very careful. You never eat one of these unless you are very, very sure of what it is. But uh, there's so much interest in uh, the fungi world these days. They're uh, mycelial networks of connected, communicating organisms that are all linked in the ground is really a fascinating um, subject. There's some great new documentary films, and it's just an area of great interest now. So. Um, and for those of you that recall Michael Pollan's visit a couple weeks ago, he's written extensively now in his last two books about uh, one is called How to Change Your Mind and one is called This is Your Brain on Plants, I think it's called. Anyway, tonight we're delighted to welcome Francis Moore LaPay, Tiffany Patton, and Anna LaPay as our guests. And we're going to be talking about reimagining our relationship to food. You'll recall we started the semester with Alice Waters. We talked about values. The second class, we were with Michael Pollan, and we talked about systems. And then last week, we talked about farmers and farming and hearing stories from Nikiko Masamoto and Nina Ichikawa. We really got a sense of how culture ends up in agriculture. They're personal stories were really, really touching. Um, so tonight we're going to start with a video uh, interview that I just recorded with Francis Moore LaPay, who's one of my Yo mama, heroes. yo mama. And uh, I think I'll ask Pooja to run that. It's about 15 minutes. And what's special about it is, well, you'll see the sort of origin of Francis's discovery of her purpose. And one of the things we hope you'll be able to do in the course of this semester in Edible Ed is discover or refine or reveal your question or your purpose. So think about that while you listen to this conversation. And Pooja, I'll send it over to you now. Okay. Um, can you can you all see the movie? Yes. Great. Okay. And then, Will, if you could just give me a thumbs up if the audio was working, that would be okay. Good. It's not working. The sound. I don't hear it. Time says uh, now it's working. God, my... There we go. Hi, I am here with Francis Moore LePay who the New York Times has uh, heralded as the godmother of the plant-centered food movement. And it was just 50 years ago that this life-changing book, Diet for a Small Planet, was published. And it has just been reissued in a beautiful 50th edition, 50th anniversary edition with a new um, introduction and updated recipes. This book has changed more people's lives than I think any that I can imagine. And um, Frankie, as she's known, by her friends. Uh, you and I met maybe a little over 30 years ago at a, an event called the Social Venture Network, which was a group of, I would say, um, idealist innovators, entrepreneurs, activists, organizers who had been informed as sort of children of the 60s. And they were trying to find a new way in the world to make change. And out of that group came many of the sort of legendary entrepreneurs of that era, Ben and Jerry and um, Gary Hirschberg and Paul Hawken and people now who are, you know, continuing to do work. And um, like them, you have persisted all of these years in um, bringing voice 
to critical issues. And I'm so glad you're here with us today for our classes. And, and to make this really special for our students, I was hoping you would start your story or maybe a little bit before this, but you found yourself, in the book you tell this story, but you found yourself in the library on the UC Berkeley campus trying to solve a big problem. Can you tell us that story? Well, I got to Berkeley because my first husband, Mark LePay, was a postdoc in the Life Sciences Building. And so I had access to the UC Berkeley Libraries, hey. And I had just come out of a very, very uh, lesson-filled time in my life where I was a warrior in the war on poverty in Philadelphia. I was working with the poorest people in Philadelphia and paid for by the city. I was hired to go door to door and bring people together and really make sure they knew their rights under the law and could get decent housing. And the woman I worked most closely with my career, the woman in the early 40s died of a heart attack. And I was convinced that my friend Lily died not of a heart attack, but of poverty. And I wasn't clear how could my life address the roots. And at the same time, the world, you know, all the experts were telling us that scarcity was the reality. Scarcity was the reality. And I, I said, oh, if I could just get to the truth of that, particularly around food, which is the most serious scarcity, uh, if I could understand that, then maybe that would unlock the mysteries of economics and politics, and I would have an understanding of why Lily died so unnecessarily so young. And so I made a vow to myself to just dig until I understood, okay, is it really true? Is you know, the book Fan in 1975 and was in the air around that time, and, and as a, um, Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, telling us we were just overwhelming the earth. And so I said, oh, food. It's the most basic thing. If I could understand why hunger, that would that would give me a pathway. And so I found a friend and librarian and I said, okay, uh, I want to understand, is it really true that we're running out? And literally, you know, this is before all of the, before the internet, of course, and everything, literally went from from stack to stack and putting the numbers together with my dad's slide rule, which I'm sure our audience most of that don't even know what that is anymore. Uh, but I put the numbers together and ah, what? There's more than enough. And I just had to tell the world because for me, that was a great finding that no, this is great news. If we're creating hunger out of plenty, then we can end it. It's not inevitable. And so I wrote a one page handout that became Diet for Small Planet. And I want to tell all the students that I made a D on my first English paper in college. So I never imagined I would be a writer. So you never know. Well, that was very auspicious to be uh, on the Berkeley campus when you had this aha. And I should point out, your story really illuminates this ability to connect sort of disparate things happening into uh, an aha or an insight. So um, poverty, uh, health, planet, you saw all of these inter interdependencies uh, at a time when that was not critically important. Today, we have such a rush of, in, you know, interest and um, venture capital investment and new companies starting. It's, it's a very exciting time. And I, I get dozens of inquiries a month from people saying, I want to shift my work now from, you know, tech into something meaningful like food. So you really started with the seed of what was meaningful to you and this personal relationship you had with this woman you lost. Exactly. And the way I think of it is that I found my question. And that is something that still is always with me. What is my question? What is the next question? You know, what is the question behind that question? And so that I, I think that I have to thank my parents because they were such learners. They were always reading and talking about, you know, and, and, and exploring. And I think that is what I'm most grateful for in my life that I, I realized early on that I could find my own questions. And then from there, look behind it. Okay, well then why that? And then why that? And if you 
or keep asking the questions, you're never bored <laughs> and you keep learning and you keep feeling that you are going deeper and having more meaning in your life. Love that. So questions and libraries are both very, <laughs> um, important um, things in your life. Um, Frankie, you know, your new, the new edition of your book really um, grounds a lot of the issues in, um, in the perils that we face in democracy now. I mean, you, you really show us um, how essential the politics of food are to freedom and well-being and, and, and civic um, mutual respect. And I just read a, um, an essay or an opinion piece by Francis Fukuyama today in the, in the mm -hmm. New York Times, and he um, you know, cites that democracy is really in decline um, around the world. And um, the United States sort of own decline as a, um, a as a source of credibility in the world is really um, key now. Can you yes. talk a little bit about the questions you might have now that you're thinking about with respect to food and democracy and community? Yes. Now, I think of democracy as the tabard crisis because without decision making that is accountable to people to the interest of all of us and we all have voice then we cannot solve climate crisis we can't solve the hunger crisis you name it and so um democracy has always been for me the the tackler issue and how do i take the the, the question of food quality and hunger and take it back to okay Let's peel away the layers and realize that we we have to be always devoting some of our energy to that core question. And it's not an either or that we can we can express ourselves through activism in the food movement and directly in growing and feeding ourselves and at the same time weigh in as citizens. Right now it's the freedom to vote act. I mean, it's a critical, critical moment for democracy. You you, you noted that we rank poorly. Just this morning, I was checking the numbers again, and now we rank 61st in the world in terms of political and social rights and measures of what we think of as a good democracy. 61st, way down. We're not even in the same category as Western Europe. So I think most Americans are not aware of how much we have to learn from others. And so that's really one theme song of my life is I actually started a news service focused on solutions news so we could we can and this was in the 90s so we could see what's happening because we are such social creatures and we're modeling ourselves on each other all the time and if we don't have stories of citizens engaged in making real change at the root taproot level of democracy then we will th will not think it's possible so that's another key part of my message so even as um, students get excited and want to rush in and start a new kind of plant-based food company or you know get involved with um, social and equity issues around health and with food we have to pay attention to the issues of democracy and citizenship we can't we we, we have to be broad in our right life. and this is this is very you know it's not just a loose connection i mean we know the way that on climate change, how they, well, the the uh, fossil fuel industry has shifted our policies and kept us locked in. We know the role of Monsanto, say, infusing the whole GMO strategy into acceptance by our um, Food and Drug Administration and, and Department of Agriculture, et cetera. So we know the direct influence of private interests that are allowed. And one reason that our democracy ranks so low and it, so it's not some loose connection, you know, it's it's really who has influence. There are now 20 lobbyists in Washington uh, for every person that you and I have elected to represent us there. And agribusiness is part of that, you know, and uh, the fossil fuel industry is part of that. So I, I just want to underscore that this is not just a loose connection with democracy. It's a day-to-day it's -a -day reality. Let me take this in a little different direction. You know, this class um, is focused on change making and you've been a serial entrepreneur 
you know, you started lots of different um, organizations, you've written dozens of books. Um, tell us something uh, that, that sort of informed your sense of taking action. What, 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 what do we not know about you from your, your resume or even the story you tell in the book? Well, directly, I think what changed me, and I alluded to it, was coming of age right at the moment of the war on poverty and when we had this can-do spirit that we could really make change and government was working with citizens. So I was very fortunate to come of age at that time. But my childhood is also very, um, you know, a, a very important part of this because I lived for two years on a small island in the Pacific Ocean, and there were probably a dozen nationalities represented, among 600 people or so. My dad was a weatherman for the government during that time. And just being exposed to all these different cultures who had something to contribute, and I, I just just ate it up, literally. <laughs> I loved the food. I loved all the different and, and it made me an internationalist. It made me want to have and able to have a global perspective. And I think that's that's so difficult for many Americans who grow up thinking, oh, we're the center of it all. And if you have as a child, you fall in love with these different cultures and you learn their dances and, and their idiom, that you realize that you know, we're all participants. Um, and I love to quote uh, the late Hans Peter Durer, the German physicist who told me once, Frankie, in uh, biological systems, there are no parts, only participants. Mm. And he means by that not, of course, just biology outside of us, but we are all changing, we're all related moment to moment. So even our inaction actually changes the world. Everything we do and don't do ripples out. And I think. You know, that childhood experience of absorbing all these different cultures just really opened my eyes to the world. You know, you had these insights um, around the centrality of food uh, 50 years ago, and you sounded the alarm, you took action, you published, you spoke, you organized, um, you communicated, you created these different entities. Um, but how do you, what is it in you that helps you endure? Because it must be frustrating sometimes to think like, gee, I saw this coming and um, I, I tried to sound the alarm. I tried to shape the culture, but we find ourselves now in dire straits and we really need to take action. What, what gives you, you know, a, 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 the energy and the, desire to continue on and endure? Well, I, I think we all need the nourishment of, of example. We need the, we are social creatures. And I, I try to feed my soul and feed my energy with, as, as I said, I started the Solutions News Service, but where are people doing better than we are? And so my my I sort of walk on the two two feet, you know, of on the one hand, making sure Americans know how out of step we are with our image of ourselves. And it's really worse than we think in terms of our our quality of our democracy and the decimation of, of biodiversity that our agriculture is perpetrating and on and on. Um, so at the same time, I try always to add the stories of what I call the stories of possibility. Where are people getting it right? And what can we learn? Not to model, but to be inspired, as I think we're all creators. It's not just taking somebody else's thing and slapping it on, but how can we, what are the core lessons? And so I think that, um, and also, you know, I think also when I talk to young people, it's, it's um, maintaining relationships over a lifetime. And so, you, you know, keep those friends that you are building now at Berkeley. And uh, my closest friend I met at Berkeley um, over 50 years ago, and she still, we still are on the phone talking about how we're, we're coping now. And so I think it's a combination of that very personal uh, support from people who've known you throughout, and then being sure that no matter how dark the feeling is, 
that you're also adding into your into your mental emotional diet uh stories of possibility or wherever you can find them and you know there is um you know yes magazine and uh, uh they're very important examples and we try on our website uh, at small planet always to include stories of possibility i love that thank you 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 um this notion of continuity in one's life through friendship, through relationship, through commitment. You are, um, Francis Ford LePay, an enduring source of inspiration to me. And I know now that our students have been introduced to the godmother of plant-centered <laughs> eating, um, they will uh, run for your book. And um, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Really what did you like? What did you like? Thank you so much, Will. It's so great to meet you. Okay. Thank you. I'll come back on the screen here if you can see me. Um, maybe, Pooja, you could highlight my video. There we go. Perfect. Uh, so, well, maybe you could go to the next uh, slide too. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to think for a minute is what is the question that you're asking right now that might be emerging from this class. I thought that was such a powerful insight that she provided about what it is that continues to motivate her and fuel her curiosity. I'm just so struck by her enduring commitment and energy. You can just feel it in, in her speech. So I'd like you to uh, go to the chat now and just log in for us a question that you're thinking about that has to do with food, values, systems, action, inspiration. And please contribute it because we're going to actually use this as part of the attendance today. So we'd love to hear from all 175 of you. Um, you can take a minute or two with this. You can read what other people are are putting in. Thank you. We can also share this chat text back into our discussion board. I think that would be really fun. You might be able to find people who are asking similar or questions that could be debated. Terrific, thank you all. Okay, Pooja, maybe take down the slide and I'm gonna begin to introduce our special guests today. Uh, we have live with us tonight uh, Tiffany Patton and Anna LePay, who happens to be the offspring of Francis Moore LePay. And Tiffany and Anna have been frequent guest teachers in Edible Ed for many years, and I always enjoy what they have to to um, to share. They they are actually um, they provide the nourishment of example, as Francis said, of change makers. They've both been incredibly um, industrious and creative. Uh, you've read their bios, but just to highlight a little bit, they are both um, change makers of real food media. Uh, Anna also is a co-founder and member of the Small Planet Institute with her mother and uh, Tiffany and Anna work to create and share inspiring stories of food systems change making. Tonight, they're going to bring you a global perspective that I think will really complement uh, the, the conversations that we've had to date. Um, I think that real food media is a perfect, perfect example of a generator of stories of possibility. So I want to thank you both for being here um, with us today and um, 
leading this conversation for the students. So welcome, Tiffany and Anna. Thanks so much, Will. That was a really generous welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, so I'll just sort of launch right in. Um, I know this year's theme is about reimagining eating in and eating out. And today, Anna and I are just going to pull back a little bit and talk about reimagining a relationship with food and what that looks like here and around the world. Um, so obviously during the pandemic, many people saw their relationship to food shift. Um, there was grocery store outages and we witnessed a huge uptick in need at food banks and also I've seen how how essential workers, especially those who work in the food system, are treated, which is mostly poorly, right? Denied protective equipment and paid sick leave and also pushed to work in these dangerous conditions without any sort of support. But that's not all that's been happening during this time, right? We've also seen this explosion of mutual aid, of people banding together to meet this immense need. And so I think that in the past couple of years, for many people, there's been a huge shift in um, our relationships to each other and to food. But these shifts are not just limited to the pandemic. And today we're gonna talk about some places in the world where, they, where people are related to food in a way that is different from what we see here in the mainstream and what's possible when you link that imagination with action. And um, as Will mentioned, Frankie and Anna, uh, Francis and Anna are really great examples of people who sort of take on a new perspective and drive action toward this new way of relating. So Anna um, has worked on the 50th anniversary edition of Diet for a Small Planet with Francis and also co-authored another book with her, um, Hope's Edge. And in this book, you both traveled to five continents, visiting like rural and urban sites alike, talking with so many different kinds of people um, and seeing how they interact with food and democracy and what they're creating with it. So Anna, can you tell us uh, the origin story of Hope's Edge? Sure. Uh, and again, thank you, Will, for, for having us and for this course that I get so much nourishment from. And, you know, I, it's a real delight to be having this conversation with Tiffany. One of the joys, you know, my mother talked about how do we find joy in a world in which so much is feeling like it's going off the rails. And a huge part of joy for me and for Tiffany is to do work with people who we really respect and who we learn from and who push us to take bigger risks and, and try to have bigger impacts. So uh, working with the team at Real Food Media has been a big source of joy for me. And Tiffany, you were asking about this origin story of this book, Hope's Edge. And I was thinking about it as I was listening to my mother, which was a very weird experience, I will say, <laughs> will say seeing that pre-record. Uh, but, uh, but it was lovely to hear her again. I've heard it before, but hear her talk about the origins of Diet for a Small Planet, because it got me reflecting on the path that led to Hope's Edge and and kind of how my sense of food became reimagined as a result. So when uh, my mother uh, was looking at the kind of the, the landmark of the 30th anniversary of Diet for a Small Planet, I and my brother really pushed her to consider what we saw is like taking the next step with that book. So if Diet for a Small Planet has shown us, and as you heard my mom describe, that so much of the root causes of hunger in the world is not because of a scarcity of food, but it's because of a scarcity of democracy. It's that people in many places all around the world do not have the power that they should have to make their own choices about what food is grown, what practices are used on their farm, who has access to it, all of those big questions that ultimately tie us to the big idea of democracy and power and control. And so we put back to her this question of, well, if that was the animating question and animating message of Diet for a Small Planet, what would it look like to travel around the world and try to find places, cities and social movements and civil society organizations that are really getting at that root, that are looking at what is what, what does it look like to start actually building power from the ground up, to start actually addressing that root cause of hunger? So that was the animating 
idea behind Hope's Edge. I was a graduate student at the time at Columbia University, and initially I, I volunteered to be my mother's research research assistant, and then uh, she promoted me to be her with author, and then she promoted me to be her co-author. But as Tiffany has heard me say before, getting promoted by your mother is not exactly the most impressive uh, mm -hmm. move in a career, but it was this incredible experience, and we document in India, Bangladesh, Poland, Kenya, France, Brazil, and here in the United States, these examples and these stories. And for me, the process totally changed the direction of my life because not only did we tell these and see these incredible stories and incredible models out there, uh, but I witnessed firsthand what had been very theoretical until that point, which is the incredible, devastating negative impact of US-based food corporations and of US government trade policy. So, you know, just to give one example, like on one of our research trips into the foothills of the Himalayas, we're driving along this dirt road uh, surrounded by a eucalyptus grove to visit a community that had never met people from the United States before. And yet, you know, on this narrow dirt road to our right on all of the eucalyptus trees I could see were painted the Pepsi logo. And when we got to the village, we found that it was easier for this community to get access to Pepsi than it was to find potable drinking water. And when we sat down with these community leaders, what we found that they were struggling against was that Monsanto had just taken out a patent at the international courts on their sacred neem tree, that their, you know, the neem tree in Indian culture is mul has multitude, multitude of benefits, nutritional and 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 spiritual, cultural. And Monsanto had just taken out a patent on the neem tree, and this community was engaging with this you know, global battle. And it just was hit home so powerfully that the choices that are made here in this country have these incredible global ripples. And it inspired me to think about what can uh, I do? What can I become a part of that can help to uh, have essentially the opposite effect, have the choices that we make here actually increase well-being, help the environment, you know, uphold human rights. Uh, so um, yeah, I mean, there's many more stories to tell from that research, but I'll, I'll stop there, Tiffany. One of the things that I really enjoyed uh, about the book, other than, you know, everything that y'all wrote in it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> was the sort of the framework that y'all had for these like five, um, five thought traps. And I feel like those thought traps are really just narratives um, that limit our imagination and then uh, correlating a five, like uh, five liberating ideas. That, that go against them. Um, and one of the ones that, thought trap number two was around the idea of selfishness, right? We have this thought trap or limiting narrative that like as humans, we are like born selfish and we are competitive by nature. And because everyone else is, up, everyone else is looking out for themselves, like we have to as well or be left behind. And yet so that's not entirely true, right? There've been so many examples that um, that show the exact opposite. And so in Hope's Edge, one of the, um, one of the many countries you visit is South Korea. And you have this like great story around about how like false that narrative really is about how we're not inherently selfish um, and only care about ourselves. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that South Korea research trip was, um, was amazing. And one of the, the groups that I spoke with was a, a consumer co-op. Uh, so it's a, a co-op that's really, connecting urban consumers in Seoul with farmers in the countryside. And uh, at the time I was the member of a Brooklyn, New York uh, consumer co-op that had like 13,000 members, which I thought was really huge. Uh, at the time, I think this consumer co-op in South Korea had something like 100,000 <laughs> members. Uh, but as I was learning about how the co-op worked and it was this you know, story of really helping consumers across demographics across economic strata get access to some of the most fresh, delicious, sustainably grown food you could imagine. They talked about how the co-op was structured in that they had representatives from the consumers and represented from the producers uh, on a board that would meet uh, across the course of a year to come up with their policies. And every year they annually met to decide together the price of 
their most important food that then they would sell across the co-op. And of course, in South Korea, you all can imagine what is the most important food that they're uh, that they're cooking and eating throughout the year. It's rice. And the uh, person I was interviewing at this consumer co-op uh, sort of joked with me. He was like, yeah, Anna, every year when it gets time for that part of the annual meeting, it always ends in a fight. And, but he had the smile on his face. So I, I knew he was kind of joking. So I prodded him some more. You know, what do you mean by that? What are they fighting over? And he explained that every year without fail, the farmers fight to charge less for the rice because they care about their consumers, because they're concerned about their families that they're supporting with this food and they don't want to see them suffer. They don't want them uh, to have to pay too much for their basket of food. And every year the consumers push back and they want to pay more because they want their farmers to have what they need and they want their farmers' well-being to be considered. And so, you know, it's a friendly fight. But in this conversation, it was one of these moments of reimagining, you know, growing up in this country with the way our market system works around food, we are constantly told in so many different ways that we are in opposition to producers, that consumers are on one side, producers on the, are on the other, consumers should want the cheapest food and producers should want the most. And as opposed to really seeing that, what I saw in this consumer co-op in South Korea, that there is this way that actually our all of our interests are aligned. And if we can figure out mechanisms to help us see that alignment and work, you know, work together, that it can really, it, it can be transformative. And that's certainly what I saw in South Korea, for sure. And you've also done some writing and research around um, like the nature of our nature that also speaks to this. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so one of the thought traps, I mean, it, you can call them thought traps or mental maps. It's essentially the kind of ideologies that we hold. And so much, and Tiffany, you and I work on this so much at Real Food Media, so much of the work of shifting how people understand what is possible is the work of first letting people in on the fact that there are these mental maps that we hold. So often the dominant mental maps are so everyday. They're like the air we breathe, we don't even notice it. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is to say, here's this idea we're holding and, and might there be a way to reimagine it? And one of these ideas that we talk about, uh, we talk about at Hope's Edge and we talk about in our work at Real Food Media is as you said, this idea that you know we're, we're inherently selfish, we could never, we can never work together to fix the crisis, whether it's the hunger crisis or the climate crisis because of that innate uh, selfishness and our innate ability to kind of care for, oursel care for ourselves, care for our planet, care for each other. And uh, I, um, over the past couple of years have been doing a lot of work with uh, community activists on the islands of Hawaii who have been working on uh, creating food security on islands of Hawaii and pushing back against the pesticide industry that has a huge outsized impact in Hawaii. And I was visiting with these community advocates uh, uh, a couple years ago, and they were telling me about a book that their colleagues had just published called The Statues That Walked. And it's a book that rewrites the story of Easter Island. And as I read the book and as I talked to these colleagues of mine in Hawaii, I felt the sense of, again, a kind of reimagining and a breaking through of a mental map that I think many of us hold. And it's a mental map that tells us that we human, human beings, we're not just selfish and we don't just you know, care about ourselves, but take that idea far enough and we're willing to kind of destroy our planet for our own self-interest. And often the story of Easter Island gets presented that way. We're, we're, we're told the dominant idea is that... Um, it, it, you know, is that the, the people who lived on the islands were obsessed with these uh, huge statue idols to their gods and that they were so, had, had such a strong ideology that they were uh, cutting down trees to roll the statues to the edge of the, the island. And, you know, this is what we see today, these huge, huge statues. And we are told by folks like Jared Diamond who have written about uh, Easter Island that it shows that we humans will cut down the very last tree and only then we'll think, oh, you know, what have we done? That's not sustainable. And what this anthropologist and archaeologist did was they actually looked at the archaeological record, the anthropological record, and they found a very different story, which is that actually the people of Easter Island had figured out all kinds of innovative ways to grow abundant food on the islands. And what folks had considered as just kind of this rock-strewn island, the archaeologists 
realize those aren't arbitrarily tossed around rocks that I Actually, those were rock gardens, 2,533 2, of these rock garden formations where the people who populated the islands had created these ecological food systems. They were abundantly growing food uh, and that actually uh, the way that the uh, that the, the statues were moved to the edge of the island wasn't because of the native population cutting down the trees, but actually the statues were put on top of the logs uh, or top of the vines and kind of uh, teeter tottered out to the, to the island. And the anthropologist said, you know, the native people had passed down through oral history, this story of the statues that walked, but the historians that were writing the, the dominant story dismissed those tales dismissed the oral history as just kind of gobbledygook, you know, they didn't trust it, they didn't believe in it. And, um, and so this, this story of Easter Island and the reimagining, reimagining of it to me is such a hopeful one. You know, it is this, this rethinking of, of human beings capacity to actually work in concert with nature and not to, uh, you know, uh, blindly exploit it. That's such a cool story. And so, as you said, like really inspiring and hopeful just to think that, of course, there's these, there's these other ways of being and people have been doing it. Um, and that makes me wonder, you know, like who, who like benefits from these other narratives um, that are being pushed. And I, that's another qu question that we can like go into now, actually. Um, we think a lot about the narratives that we hear and what's written down, right? They always say like history is written by the victors, but also there are all these like other narratives that you said are around us, like the air that we breathe that we just like assume to be true. Um, and there's not a lot of questioning around like, where did this narrative come from? Is it like objectively true? Um, and I know that you've, you've done so much work, Anna, around industry spin. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about about some of the narrative work that you've, some of the like narrative work that you've seen, some of the dominant narratives that like pesticide companies, for example, have mm -hmm. been pushing. Yeah, I mean, well, in this, this question, Tiffany, is really the origin story of Real Food Media, which is, uh, I wrote uh, about 12 years ago, I published a book called Diet for a Hot Planet. It's obvious homage to my mother about the connection between food and climate. And I was struck on book tour for that book. I kept hearing in the, conversations I would have, so many of the same questions that people had and sort of doubts about the ability for sustainable agriculture to feed the world or um, these kind of questions that they were asking. And it didn't matter where I was. It didn't matter whether the audience was young or old or coastal or uh, central part of the country. And what I started realizing as I started looking at the information that we are getting from the companies that benefit from the dominant uh, and status quo agriculture here in this country, pesticide companies and other input companies that are producing fertilizers, for instance, or the companies that are uh, profiting from factory farms, that I realized that they have operations to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars a year <laughs> in producing not just the classic you know, advertisements that we see about a product, mm -hmm. but actually doing this narrative work, uh, telling a story about their sector, telling a story about a way of growing food, and that that narrative story was popping up in the questions I was getting from the audiences I was speaking to. And so Real Food Media, we started with a video uh, we called our Food Myth Buster video that takes on, I think, probably the biggest myth of all that uh, chemical corporate agriculture feeds the world mm -hmm. and kind of tries to break that apart and talk about how that idea is constructed and uh, how we might understand and reimagine what is possible and how we can actually feed the world. And this kind of constant uh, narrative work <laughs> that the industry engages in. Uh, we see it all the time in big ways and small ways. And uh, just earlier this week, I know I, I shared with you, Tiffany, I was looking at uh, the headlines at Politico. I don't know how many of you read uh, Politico news, but you know, like DC based talking about policy and I'm scrolling through the headlines. And then I get to this little box on my screen on the website that is uh, a fact, looks like a fact sheet about a group of pesticides called neonicotinoids or known for short as neonics. And the little block text calls, you know, this is facts about neonics. And in this text, it said, 
you know, these uh, pesticides are a class of pesticides that are vital to agriculture and a cornerstone of integrated pest management. And then it goes on to talk about how great these pesticides are. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the website that it would send you to, neonicfacts.org, and scroll to the bottom of that website, you'd realize it's actually produced by a group called uh, Growing, uh, Growing Concern, I think it was called. And if you look at who is behind that, I bet you all could guess. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the pesticide companies. Right. Yeah, they're telling you these pesticides are fine. What they're not telling you is that actually these pesticides that are only about 25 to 30 years old have increased the toxicity of American agriculture by 48 times since they were introduced. They're some of the most toxic pesticides out there. And because they are water soluble and they were marketed as, well, so they won't drift in the air and therefore be safer, but because they're water soluble, they, as soon as the rains come, they leach into our groundwater. And now across this country where neonicotinoids are used so widely, we have incredible contamination that's impacting insect populations. And so reading this, little block of text at Politico and peeling the layers behind who's telling that story, what is their financial interest in telling us that story, and what kind of accountability should we expect of our media institutions uh, to actually help us distinguish between what is news and what is corporate propaganda. Uh, so uh, there is a lot more work <laughs> to be done uh, to, uh, to address how much misinformation is out there from the industry. Uh, and, and you know, at Real Food Media, we, we try to expose it and try to document it as much as we can because it plays such a role in, again, what we think is possible, what, what we think we need, and whether we think we need something like pesticides to feed the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know so often we think that narratives sort of just come up naturally, um, but this just goes to show that they're not just a thing that, they, I mean, they do happen naturally and they can also happen because an industry decides to put hundreds of millions of dollars into crafting a narrative that, that benefits them. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I want to share just like a quick anecdote about, about narrative and like what and how it can just shift how we view things. And it was actually, I learned this during an edible ed class two years ago. Um, and I got to interview Kristen Lee. She's a Berkeley Food Institute change maker and farmer at Namu Farm and seed saver. Um, she shared the story of amaranth and how amaranth was an essential food crop for people on almost every continent except for Antarctica. And when the Spanish colonized the Americas, they ended up banning the cultivation of amaranth because it's not only an essential food crop, so people you know, needed it for their like physical survival, but it was also seen as a sort of like spiritual kin to people and it kept them connected to their culture. And so they, they banned the cultivation of it. They burned fields full of amaranth. They murdered people who were associating with it. And over time, um, amaranth, this amazing plant that is wildly nutritious, um, it became to be known as a weed. And now it's also like colloquially known as pigweed, right? And there's technologies devoted to killing this, this very prolific weed, which is actually, as I mentioned, a highly nutritious crop that also sequesters carbon at um, a much higher rate than like other similar plants, but we're calling it a weed and developing new ways to annihilate it. And so this is an example of how changing what we call something sort of changes our relationship to it. And in this case, um, changing it to be calling to it being called pigweed, divorce it from its meaning and its context, and sort of separates us from it. Um, and so Kristen said this thing that I thought that I really enjoyed, which was just like when anytime you hear a narrative or a story, just like think about like think about what else could be out there. Uh, think about all the other stories that are possible. Yeah, I love that, that story. And Tiffany, it gets me thinking about, you know, even the other kind of, so we talk about weeds and we talk about needing to eradicate them with chemicals. Mm -hmm. We also talk about pests. I mean, the, and the word pesticide actually refers to, uh, to a whole bunch of different products. It in includes herbicides and fungicides and insecticides. Um, but we have this, this notion that there are pests on a farm. And, and one of my reimaginings that has come up so many times in talking to ecological farmers mm -hmm. is they've said, Anna, I don't think there's any pests on my farm. Right. That uh, I remember talking to one farmer who described himself as a population manager. <laughs> it's like all these all of these species play a role 
And he's like, my job is to help them, you know, be, live their best lives. <laughs> but so he would do things instead of spraying toxic chemicals, would do things like plant amazing flowering crops that would attract what a conventional or industrial farmer might call a pest, but attract those, um, uh, those insects to those crops, leaving, say, his strawberries to, to flourish beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but many of the farmers that we've spoken with, again, have this understanding of the kind of natural uh, symbiosis that you can create if you are not attacking your farm with chemicals. Right. There are no, there's no such thing as weeds or pests. <laughs> They're just like different plants and different insects. And yeah. Right. No, um, no, dis no disposable plants, no disposable pests, just like no disposable people. Right. Exactly. Uh, I want to shift gears and um, take us like back on the road, so to speak. Uh, and like, I want to hear a little bit about your time uh, in Brazil and uh, specifically in Belo Horizonte. Um, yeah. Where they have this different approach to addressing food and hunger. Yeah. So the, the Belo Horizonte story, um, uh, a colleague of Tiffany and mine, uh, Jahi Chappelle, wrote a really fabulous book called Beginning to End Hunger, uh, where he tells the story of this city. And uh, we did a Real Food Reads podcast uh, where we interviewed Jahi about the book. Uh, but what so captivates us about the story is that it was a, 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 such a powerful example of what becomes possible, what creativity becomes possible when you break out of a dominant mental map. And so the dominant mental map that got busted uh, in the city at the time, it was the fourth largest city of Brazil when we were there, uh, was a city government, a progressive city government got elected to office. And they started asking themselves a pretty fundamental question, which is if we were elected by the people of this city and it is their being, their well being that we should be serving, if there is hunger in this city, then it is our responsibility to end it and to look at what isn't working, what, what aspects of the market economy isn't working, what aspects of uh, connectivity to producers isn't working, so that everybody in this city should have access to good, nutritious food. And they took this kind of human right to food framework mm -hmm. to their role as elected officials in this city. And as a result, they, cr they came up with and of dozens of really creative public policies and Jahi he writes them, writes about them in the book and many of these public policies we we now see around the world but they did really in a lot of ways really simple things like they saw incredible uh uh infant mortality rates in their city uh, and they looked at they, at the same time, they looked at all of this really highly nutritious food that was being wasted, like manioc leaves and eggshells and things that were going into the waste stream, but actually highly nutritious. And they developed a highly nutritious flour that then they gave out for free to all of these prenatal clinics. And they saw infant mortality rates drop. They did things like they saw this unused city land and they offered it for free to area farmers. It, and so it was a great deal for those farmers to be in these really uh, well-trafficked urban spots in the city, but they offered it to those farmers on one condition, that they also took their bounty out into some neighborhoods that were uh, lower economic neighborhoods, poorer neighborhoods in the city. Uh, but perhaps like my biggest memory of being there, because it was like blew my mind of what's possible, was going to one of the, the, the grocery stores that the government had created. So what they did is they looked at where in the city were there kind of these edge neighborhoods between higher income and lower income neighborhoods. And they created these retail outlets where they gave, uh, they, they, they uh, provided a really great deal for area farmers to bring their food there. And it was all just pure produce. There was no packaged products. There was no plastic. There was nothing. It was just bins upon bins upon bins of the freshest, most delicious food. It was, and every single item of food was priced the same. And so the shopping experience was just, you bring your basket or your bag and you, you, you pick from the, the, the bounty and the government was subsidizing those products for, um, for the, the people in the, in the, the city. And what they were finding about all of this is that it actually wasn't destroying their city budget, that it actually was, uh, 
was actually saving them money, um, mm-hmm. saving them money for all other kinds of social welfare programs that they didn't have to invest in because people were healthier and people were better fed. And at the end of our time in Belo Horizonte, uh, I'll never forget, we were interviewing one of the leaders of this work. And she's talking about the lessons that she learned from doing this work. And as she's kind of sharing the kind of the lessons she learned, she starts tearing up and kind of tears start rolling down her face. And she said, you know, when I started this work, I just didn't realize how easy it is to end hunger. Mm. And now she did not mean easy. Like these people worked harder than I think anybody I have ever met. So not easy in that sense. I mean, these people were working themselves to the bone, but easy in the sense of when you liberate yourself from some of these dominant ideas about how we organize our economy and what is our relationship to food, when you do that, all kinds of possibilities uh, emerge. And that's really what they saw there. Uh, so I really uh, you know, keep her words in my, you know, in my consciousness as much as I can. Um, mm-hmm. And it's been really, um, you know, part of, you know, my formation is thinking about, again, what, what can we reimagine even, even here in the U S what can we reimagine? Yeah. I really love that approach. Cause it's not just about like, how are we getting like cans of food to people to make it so they're not food insecure, but it's really just about how do we like holistically take care of, of our communities. And they found a way to do that, that like address hunger and like secured livelihoods for people. Uh, can you tell us, are there I think there's a, like some burgeoning, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to call it a movement, but there's um, uh, there's that happening over here in the States, right? This human right to food approach. Could yeah. A little bit about where that's happening and yeah. what is sort of made possible when you look at food in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think I've been really encouraged over the past decade, or, I mean, really, or more, at how much um, we're seeing emerging around the country in terms of people and movements and, and, uh, 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 organizations drawing these connections and, um, you know, Tiffany, I know you work, we both work a lot with a group called Heal Food Alliance, which mm-hmm. uh, I know some folks from there have spoken at edible education uh, courses in the past. Uh, but what excites me about all that work is the sense of people really looking at what is and not accepting it and saying, how can we fix it? So looking at the fact that, for instance, universities spend, what is it, $7 billion a year on food every year. Mm-hmm. So why shouldn't those university dollars that students are paying for uh, go toward food that aligns with the values that students hold? Or um, in the case of this new effort that I'm really excited about, uh, a group of folks are asking, you know, what would it look like to actually bring the human right to good food to the United States? Mm-hmm. So as some of you may know, the United States uh, never ratified the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. We never have. (laughs) Um, uh, But that covenant recognizes the right to food. Mm -hmm. And so a group of people have been looking at what would it look like to actually rewrite state constitutions to bring that human right to food to people. Mm -hmm. And so they started organizing in a couple of states and actually the state of Maine just rewrote their state constitution where now on paper, at least there is this acknowledgement that there is this human right to good food. And, you know, in no way does putting those words on paper all of a sudden mean that everybody in the state of Maine (laughs) is now, you know, well-fed and has access to good food. But what it does is it enables organizers now in that state. It enables elected officials now in that state. It enables everyday people in that state to say, wait a second, this is written into our state constitution. And if this is not happening here, you know, what do we need to change? What do we need to mobilize around to make it happen here? Uh, and there've been now a couple other states that are looking at doing this kind of organizing. And so, uh, like all of the work that we're involved in, I don't think any of it is going to, you know, be the only thing that 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 solves everything. Mm-hmm. Yet I think that this is again another way to inspire people to think differently about their relationship to food. Nice. And what you mentioned just now about like Belo Horizonte and then also Heal Food Alliance and so many of our other other like partners um, is I've just noticed that they have this right and like not accepting the status quo and yeah, having yeah. the sort of like audacity to like dream bigger and just demand that people do better. Um, 
Exactly. So, yeah. So now it's, we're going to go into sort of breakout rooms. The class is going to go into breakout rooms. They're going to have a question. Um, we have 10 minutes to answer that and then a five minute break before we return here for the uh, Q and A portion. So if you have some questions ready for Anna and I, just please hold on to them and then ask us when you come back. But the prompt for your breakout room is what brought you here? What is your path to this course? And again, you'll have 10 minutes for that and then a five minute break. So finish that up at like 721 and then um, be back here at 726, very specific times. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, I think we should all be back. I think we should all be back now from the break. Um, so this is the time for Q&A with Anna and I. And if you want to, or please drop some questions into the chat. Um, I think just to kick it off, I'm gonna ask Anna a question that was in the chat earlier, which is about agroecology. And um, the question is, is exactly was, how do we scale up agroecological practices to a meaningful level? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I saw that come through. I loved all the questions I saw zooming by. Uh, well, it's a great question. And, and uh, you know, what immediately comes to mind is this incredible opportunity I had to go to Southern India just before the pandemic. I mean, little did I know it was going to be the last time I would travel internationally for so long. But I went to Southern India with a group uh, called the Agroecology Fund. It's a global network of uh, philanthropists that are trying to support agroecological solutions around the world. And we brought together funders as well as uh, leaders of agroecological movements from dozens of countries worldwide. And we all gathered in Southern India because the state of Andhra Pradesh has been at the leading edge of scaling up uh, support for farmers that are getting off of a dependence on chemical inputs like uh, pesticides and synthetic fertilizer. To the point that I just got the latest report from Andhra Pradesh for what they call their community uh, managed natural farming, that they have now within their network 700,000 farmers across the state. And as a state government, they have a commitment to try to scale across all farmers across the state. And then just last week, I talked to a funder colleague of mine who works uh, across 15 countries in Africa, and he was talking about all of the farmer networks that they're working with, uh, connecting with uh, leaders in southern India to learn about their methodology, to learn about how to scale it up across these 15 countries uh, across the continent of Africa. So when I think about this question of how do you scale, what scale looks like in these ecological systems isn't one crop uh, by you know consolidated uh, with consolidated power across hundreds of thousands of acres. It looks like how do you actually distribute knowledge across farmers uh, and food producers uh, across vast landscapes and. You know, the, it was amazing to stand on this land in Southern India and have them show us the ecological fertilizer they were using and hear the West African farmers talk about what it would look like to apply the, their methodology to West Africa. Well, it would look different because the climate's different. The bio, you know, the, the bio ecosystem is different, but the principles stay the same. And so it's really looking at, you know, how do you, again, scale up the principles, not scale up the, you know, one commodity uh, and one production practice. Oh, wait, you're on mute. Got it. Thank you. So again, it's that whole like contextualizing it within like a, a different space, but holding on to those same, as you said, the same methods. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would add, you know, for students who are really interested in looking at how this work is scaling globally, if I don't know, Will, if you all have talked about the social movement uh, known as La Via Campesina, uh, but it was uh, launched in the mid 90s and now uh, has member organizations of food producers all around the world and they say representing hundreds of millions of farmers and has been a really powerful voice powerful global voice to talk about what would we need to change with trade policy and other kinds of policies to really enable this kind of food production to flourish thanks um, and then, okay, so in response to that answer, um, do you see a, or can you envision a pathway for that here in the US? 
Well, again, I like as I like to call myself a possibilist. Uh, you know, when I wrote a Diet for a Hot Planet 12 years ago, could I ever have imagined that our Secretary of Agriculture for the United States would make an announcement committing one billion dollars with a B to climate smart agriculture? I don't think I could have, and yet that's what Secretary Vilsack just did. Mm -hmm. um, now, whether that that money is going to go to really redistribute power and to really go to ecological solutions, or will it go to, uh, uh, you know, to sort of false solutions that aren't really helping us move the needle when it comes to climate, when it comes to carbon sequestration? That is the ultimate question. And folks all around the country are mobilizing to try to help support those farmers and ranchers that are really using ecological practices um, who've been historically underserved by the USDA to get access to some of that federal money. But to me, it was a huge signal that you have the head of our US Department of Agriculture, uh, Secretary Vilsack, uh, you know, who isn't a, 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 you know, a, a, a radical, who after uh, his last term of service at the USDA, he went uh, to work for the dairy industry as a lobbyist uh, before coming back to the USDA. But you have him really listening. I mean, in his press conference, he said, part of the, the animating force behind this announcement was that he said, look, consumers care more and more about where their food comes from and how it was produced. And his announcement was a real reflection, I think, of the fact that people have expressed a concern about those environmental impacts uh, of uh, food production here. So uh, I believe anything's possible. <laughs> Great, thank you. And so there's another question. Um that asks, how can we encourage people to have more sustainable diets? And I know obviously with your mom's diet for a small planet and your diet for a hot planet, this is something that's like very near and dear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, I think that a lot of what we try to do, we try to do at Real Food Media uh, is, you know, connects to kind of, I think a theme of the evening is connect to the joy connect to the joy of what it looks like to eat food that's good for your body and good for the planet and that has these cultural resonances. And, uh, and so it's definitely not about, you know, wagging our finger at people and telling them what they should eat and what they shouldn't eat. Uh, but it's really about thinking about how do we expose people to the deliciousness, the vibrancy of plant-centered diets. And at mm -hmm. the same time, how do we really hold the truth that, of course, for so many people, having access to delicious, healthy, nourishing food is mm -hmm. just simply not possible. And so it's why I feel like with all of our work, we never separate out the kind of individual action from, you know, we, we can't call on people individually to fix this. We really also need to change the systems to make it so that people can make the choices they want to make when it comes to what they eat. Right. So literally leading with a carrot instead of a stick and also <laughs> like changing, changing the way that changing how people access food. Like mm -hmm. no one wants, I don't think anyone like comes into this world wanting to eat things that are unhealthy and bad for the planet. That's just what is made available through a variety of, mm -hmm. a variety of mechanisms. Right. And marketed to us, right? Like mm -hmm. last I looked, Coca-Cola spent $6 billion in marketing in a year. Well. Um, you know, so it's, it's also the ways in which we are marketed to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who they choose to market to. I know there's been so much research that shows they like, like soda companies, junk food companies target black and brown communities and children like black and brown kids will see, I think as much as like twice as many ads for junk food than, than like white children will. And there's as many, like twice as many, or maybe three times as many like advertisements in these, in these communities. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, great. And so let me just, there are some other questions in here. And then I actually can't see if people are raising their hands. And so I know I said, raise your hand, raise your Zoom <laughs> hand, but I take it back. Please just drop questions into the chat. Uh, yeah, otherwise, Tiffany, I can also uh, spotlight people that raise their hands. Whatever, oh, that would be whatever's awesome. easiest for you. Yeah, that, that works as well. Thank you. I'm just taking a look at some of the earlier questions um, from, that were in the chat. There was another question um, around, let me see if I can find it. Where is Josh? I saw you had your hand raised okay. if you, if you want to. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
thanks both of you for coming to speak tonight, first of all. Um, secondly, I just wanted to say, and I really um, connected with your story about um, like the Pepsi um, and, and the sugar cane. Um, I spent only two weeks in Honduras one summer after high school. And I remember like going around and there was different, you know, either sugar cane or tobacco or different um, products. And I just remember like all the street signs um, and like the town names, like coming into the towns, it would say like, welcome to so-and-so like sponsored by Coca-Cola. And it was basically just like a factory town in which like there's the Coca-Cola factory and like everyone in the town or like local economy, obviously like work for the Coca-Cola factory. Um, in sort of response to also, you said a scarcity of democracy and like a lack of choice about like what type of food that they get to eat. Um, I think like obviously on like a socioeconomic like standpoint, obviously like the poorer people probably, you know, I mean, obviously they suffer from a lack of choice about like what to eat. Um, and so they're not going to be like as, I guess, picky or environmentally conscious or thinking about like the macro level impacts of like the food choices that they're making. They're just worried about like getting something in their stomachs because they're like so hungry. Um, and it seems like today in, um, in America, you also mentioned like how like large swaths of land are like owned by like large groups of people. Um, do you think that it's a possible remedy, I guess, to use like antitrust legislation against like large food conglomerates to break up these large swaths of land to like basically enfranchise smaller farmers? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I think antitrust legislation is key. I mean, I would say you know, to, to what you were just talking about around like people's agency to make these choices. I mean, I think one of the dominant messages that I certainly feel like I was, I, I heard uh, loud and clear throughout my life is that, uh, you know, the sort of, um, is it Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that there's sort of like, you need to, first you need to feed yourself and then only, only when you sort of get to a certain level, can you start kind of caring beyond yourself. And again, I think one of the really transformative aspects of, of the research that I did at 26 when, when I wrote Hope's Edge was to have this deep connection around the world to some of the most radical change makers I have ever, ever met. And most of them were incredibly cash poor by any standard. Uh, and it was real, you know, seeing just how much um, environmental movements actually have been driven by um, people who are most impacted by these issues and, and really, really kind of calling sort of kind of calling to question that idea that you kind of, you know, you, you can't care beyond yourself until you have the ability to meet these basic needs. And, and certainly that's what I've seen in the organizing in Hawaii. So you were talking about these company towns. Uh, so in the state of Hawaii, uh, the, you know, the pineapple and the sugar plantations were a key part of the economy for so many years. And as those companies actually have left the U.S. to find cheaper labor in other parts of the world, uh, those companies have turned over that land to agrochemical companies. And, and it's now... Uh, certain parts of Hawaii are, are are ground zero for the testing of new genetically modified crops resistant to certain pesticides and, and production of those crops. And one of the things that the, the folks that are organizing in Hawaii are looking at is exactly your, your question or your idea. You know, how do you uh, break up the control of these large land holdings? Like how do you... Um, how do you give access to land to people who actually want to feed their communities? And so one of the things that they've been doing in Hawaii is looking at some of that land is actually state-owned land uh, and looking at how can you think about um, policymaking that would uh, have that land be used for a social purpose. And there's, there's precedent for this. So the country of Brazil, when they rewrote their constitution in 1986, one of the key planks of that constitution was that if land is not serving a social purpose, it can be appropriated by the government for a social purpose. In other words, if there is just a wealthy landowner that is exploiting the land or, you know, not, or not doing anything with the land, that land reform becomes possible. And a social movement emerged in Brazil to, to make that so. Uh, of course, it's still highly unequal and it's very fraught there, but it is an example of how policymaking can actually 
shift that question of ownership. And we're certainly seeing with this administration a big conversation about antitrust. And if you're interested in um, uh, kind of, you know, learning more about that, I'll put in the chat a couple of resources for some of the folks, some of the organizations that are looking at the uh, antitrust as kind of an organizing tool for, uh, for looking at reforms in the food system. And not related to antitrust exactly, but uh, yeah. our friends at Minnow, uh, a small organization that's based in California, they're doing a lot of work to get land um, as there's this huge like land transfer happening as farmers are um, retiring and finding and like selling off their land to purchase that land and put it into community land trusts um, that are either held by indigenous people or putting into the hands of small scale BIPOC farmers. And right now their work is like primarily focused in California, but I think that that sort of thing is also really exciting too and has a lot of potential. Yeah, that's great. Hi, both of you. Thanks. That was a really fascinating talk. Oh my goodness, the camera. There we go. There we go. I'm back. Um, yeah, I think kind of staying on this topic of the uh, the bio agriculture aspect of or the the economics of agriculture aspect of things. Zooming out, maybe like uh, in this discussion of oh, we want you know less pesticides. You know, there's other farming practices that might be good or that might like serve some of the same uh, goals. And, you know, going back to, you know, previous like methods of cultivation. So, I mean, clearly the technology has allowed us to increase the amount of food we produce, you know, certainly, right? But obviously it comes with these drawbacks. So what are the ways that you can create policy to get in between there somehow? And where is the right place in between to be between like, you know, you know, ox and uh, plowing the land sort of very manually versus, right. uh, versus, you know, industrial ag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Well, I'm going to drop in uh, a new report that just came out that I think is a really great compendium mm -hmm. to, to, to really answer that question or, you know, to have you all kind of dig in and explore it. Because what we're seeing globally is and it's really, I feel like just in the past like 20 years, the amount of um, science and knowledge creation that's tapping into the millennia of human uh, innovation in agriculture with some of the best, you know, kind of, of, of like modern technology uh, to really look at what would it look like to, you know, really bring forth an agroecological system that's highly productive. Uh, because yes, uh, this kind of, uh, chemical dependent agriculture is productive, but it's only productive in a very narrow sense. Mm -hmm. it, it can deliver high yields on, on one crop, uh, but as we're seeing globally, it's leaving uh, you know, billions of people uh, essentially malnourished by eating the bad, ca you know, calories that aren't good for us. And it's uh, creating persistent hunger. And what we're finding is that these agroecological models, uh, you know, don't, it's, I don't see them as backward looking. I see them as backward pulling, you know, sort of pulling that knowledge forward and then marrying it with uh, so much of what we've learned uh, in kind of uh, in the last you know, century. Uh, because one of the things I like to remind ourselves is that the chemicals on which these this uh, whole system is built themselves are really antiquated. I mean, some of the most commonly used pesticides are, you know, no neurotoxins from World War II. You know, there isn't the the innovation in kind of agrochemicals is is really not so impressive when you look at again, like what is one of the biggest innovations in agrochemicals in the last 25 years? It's this class of pesticides known as neonicotinoids, which uh, has you know def devastated insect populations and created toxic waterways and and ultimately is going to undermine productivity. So, um, so I, I think that. Um, you know, there's just a lot, and this 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 report has kind of pulls together a lot of uh, a lot of that uh, material and a lot of that uh, looking at kind of what is the story we tell about what's possible. Thanks, Vivek. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, no other students have a question. I know Will had dropped a question in the chat as well. well. Um, which is, do you have a process at Real Food Media to help reveal the mental models you talked about? Mm. 
Is there an approach or tools that students could use to discover their own mental models and preconceived lenses? And then he also said it would be great to share some of the work you're doing with podcasts um, and just in general at Real Food Media. So multi-parter. <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> Tiffany, do you want to For start? the mental models or what we're doing? Yeah, e- yeah, yeah. Either, either one. Um, for mental models, I don't know if there's like a precise framework exactly. I know that it's just sort of like this notion of, you know, questioning, questioning everything and seeing who's behind it. I think is just sort of how we start. Um, Anna, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I I think it's it's kind of always a two step dance. It's kind of the the um, helping people have a sense of the stories of possibility. And so, you know, Tiffany and other folks on the team um, have developed some really incredible podcasts, and we uh, showcase incredible writers. We uh, talk about uh, models of policy, so showcasing the possible. And mm-hmm. then, really, the second the step of the dance is exposing. So, I think part of how one cracks open your mental maps is to start developing all of our spidey sense of when we are getting when we are getting propagandized too, and mm-hmm. how you develop that spidey sense or how you develop that muscle. I mean, it's really what it, fundamentally uh, as, as educators, as an educator will, I'm sure that you'd resonate with this. Like fundamentally, it's how do we develop our critical thinking skills? I mean, that's fundamentally what we're talking about here. And, um, and one of the ways that we develop those skills is to kind of, um, see behind the curtain and look at how narratives are constructed and look at how, for instance, the industry works. And so we do that through, at Real Food Media, we've done that through reports and through, um, uh, um, you know, videos. And, and, but then also at the same time, it's not enough just to tear down Mm -hmm. a mental frame. I mean, you have to say, well, then what, what is it that we are trying to create? What is it that we believe in? And so that's kind of the two-step dance that we try to to, to do at Real Food Media. That's wonderful. Yeah, we, and that's a great, that, that'll be very helpful um, advice for our next class, which um, next week we're going to talk about the future of food. And Larissa Zimbaroff is going to be um, talking with us. And, you know, one of the things that I've been fascinated about is how quickly the narratives spread and are... Um, you know, shaped and propelled in the marketplace these days. I mean, it's happening so rapidly. And um, I think one of the things that's really important with respect to critical thinking is to learn about uh, what are the motivations of the people who are shaping and propelling the narratives? And where is the money coming from that often shapes or funds the organizations that are propelling the narratives. And um, there are many organizations that, uh, you know, make themselves out to look like research or impartial or unbiased, but they're actually, um, you know, very much, uh, they, they have a very specific point of view, but that's not often revealed, or sometimes it's hidden um, in terms of how they present themselves. So I think critical thinking is a core, you know, objective of this class and, and everything you've shared today has been so helpful in that way. Yeah, great. Um, just one last one last note, um, you know, obviously this has been about reimagining our relationship to food and creating sort of these other visions and how we can sort of strive towards them. And, I know at Real Food Media, we um, think a lot about like, what is our vision for this year? What is our vision for like the future? And it's not just about having a new a new way of relating to things or a new vision for something, but also about how we can like move towards action. So Anna, if you, do you have any thoughts on that um, or something that you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. So we had pulled this quote we wanted to to send everyone off with um, for exactly the point that Tiffany's raising, that this is what we're calling you to do is, is, and I think what your course is will calling folks to do is this reimagining, which requires visioning. So if it's okay by all, uh, we were going to, I'll read this um, quote from Donella Meadows, who some of you may know, it's a famous systems thinker. And we'll put it into the chat after. And she says this, she says, visioning means imagining at first, generally, and then with increasing specificity, what you really want. 
That is what you really want, what you really want, not what someone has taught you to want and not what you have learned to be willing to settle for. Visioning means taking off the constraints of feasibility, of disbelief and past disappointments, and letting your mind dwell upon its most noble, uplifting, treasured dreams. We should say immediately, for the sake of the skeptics, that we do not believe vision makes anything happen. Vision without action is useless, but action without vision is directionless and feeble. Vision is absolutely necessary to guide and motivate. More than that, vision, when widely shared and firmly kept in sight, does bring into being new systems. Love that quote every time. Thank you. <laughs> and perfect, perfect serendipity because the assignment this week is to read Danella Meadows' Dancing with Systems. So See, we didn't even it? plan it. We didn't even plan it. We just... We're on the same wavelength. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's a real treat to, to be with all of you guys or with all of you all. <laughs> We're grateful. We're grateful for your leadership and your wisdom and how you always show up in um, such an inspiring and nourishing way. So thank you, Tiffany Patton. And thank you, Anna LaPay. Oh, and thank I you. Hope we'll see you again next year. That'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that was inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to head off, get to okay. the kids. <laughs> Thanks for taking time out. Yeah, take care. Bye. So uh, one of the things we do to create the uh, opening and opportunity for serendipity in this class, uh, and you can see that this class, one thing that I think makes it really special is it's, somewhat of an improvisation even though we go to great lengths to plan uh, we really invite this real-time collaboration with our guests and um, so we've always leave a slot or two at the end of the class in april uh, to try to bring and deliver your dream speakers and wishes so what we would love to do now is we're going to do a word cloud and uh, Pooja will put the link in the chat for you. And what we'd like you to do is uh, put in the name or names of the food system change makers who you'd most like to hear from uh, in our class. Uh, those people who you think would be most inspiring or most timely, uh, most provocative or um, you know, provide a perspective that, you know, isn't planned yet in our um, syllabus. So please go to the Menti link in the chat and add a name, or you can add two if you like, of people that you'd most like to hear from in Edible Ed. And while you're doing that, I will remind you that we will be back on campus next week at the Anderson Auditorium and um, it's on the Haas School of Business. It's a big room. Uh, you will need to show your green badge to get into the auditorium. You'll need to have a mask, as you well know. And we're going to do our best to um, meet in person. And Pooja, I'll let you put on the word cloud so we can see it come into formation. And then I'm going to send you off with Allison for the last. Um, this is wonderful. And some of the people whose names I see on here, we've already tried to um, contact. So we were reading your minds. But this is great, very helpful, very collaborative. And I can also see some of the names are of people that we've had to class and uh, who um, we can point you to their videos. Okay. All right, Allison, I'm gonna turn it over to you to explain next week's assignment and any last details. And we look forward to seeing you on campus next week. Awesome. Hi, everyone. So, 
Details are on B courses, but there is a homework assignment for next week, sourcing your favorite meal. This might take a little bit of research, uh, but there's more instructions there. It's looking into where's the food coming from for your favorite meal? Where, where are those ingredients sourced from? How'd they get here? Um, and then there are, again, two discussions. So one reflection post for this week and this conversation that we just had the privilege of listening to and an article on the true cost of food. And I think you'll find that there's some, definitely some overlap between some of the themes we heard tonight and some reflections on that reading. So again, details on B courses. Um, I think that is about it. Once again, we will be in person next week. Please try and arrive by about 6 p.m. just so that we can get going right at 6.10 on our Berkeley time kickoff. And we will have Larissa Zimbaroff and talking, we'll be talking about the food, the future of food, food tech and innovation. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah. you.